This, um, this quote I'm going to be reading from the Dharma Bums is uh, Jaffe Ryder speaking to uh, uh, Jack Kerouac, and actually Allen Ginsberg is also in this book. Um, his name is uh, Elvin Goldbook uh, in, in this in this novel. Um, so this is what Gary uh, Jaffe Ryder says. He means that the attitude for the bard, the Zen lunacy bard of old desert paths, see the whole thing as a world full of Russack wanderers, Dharma bums refusing to subscribe to the general demand that they consume production and therefore have to work for the privilege of consuming. All that crap they really don't want anyway, such as refrigerators, TV sets, cars, at least the new fancy cars, certain hair oils, and general junk you finally always see a week later in the garbage anyway, all of them imprisoned in the system of work, produce, consume, work, produce, consume. I see a vision of a great Russack revolution, thousands, even millions of young Americans wandering around with Russacks, going up to the mountains to pray, making children laugh, and old men glad, making young girls happy and old girls happier, all of them Zen lunatics who go about writing poems that happen to appear in the heads for no reason, and also for being the kind, and also by strange unexpected acts, keep giving visions of eternal freedom to everybody and to all living creatures. So this is an interesting passage because it, uh, you can see how this relates back to the Han Shan poems where he, uh, Han Shan is leaving society behind and just wants to study nature, wants to study Buddhism up close. And that's the same type of attitude that uh, American Buddhism had within the beat culture when it first uh, appeared in the 1950s. Uh, the point I want to make also here is that the Beats didn't actually bring Buddhism to America. That was another individual by the name of D.T. Suzuki. He's actually the one who uh, put Buddhism on the map in America. But there's no doubt that Jack Kerouac's book, The Dharma Bones, put Buddhism into a million pair of hands. And like for me, I discovered Buddhism through this book, and uh, it was very important to me. Now, not everybody thought that the, the beat Buddhism was really Buddhism. And even uh, Jack, in his book, The Dharma Bum, struggles with um, what is Buddhism in America and how does Buddhism relate to the beat life. Um, because Jack's... The interesting thing about Dharma Bums is you get a good sense of what the beat lifestyle was. The, the beat solitude that Jack... Oh, would like to, to take on. He would travel him by himself across the country, sometimes taking trains, uh, hitching a ride on the train, or, or, or driving across country. You could also see within the Dharma Bums some of the beat parties, the beat poetry readings that happened, and where there was free flowing wine. And the first instances were, were uh, uh, of the sexual revolution uh, got started within in the beat culture. And then also uh, many uh, scholars and philosophers and, and, and Buddhists thought that uh, the, the beat form of Buddhism was uh, irreverent. And I'd like to quote just briefly here uh, somebody by the name of Alan Watts. Um, who was uh, a philosopher, uh, theologian, and, um, but also a popularizer of Eastern religions in the United States in, in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. He wrote uh, an article about the, the Dharma Bums uh, and called it uh, Beat Zen, Square Zen, and Zen. And uh, let me just read this brief passage here. In the Dharma Bums, however, we are seeing Snyder through Kerouac's eyes, and some distortions arise because Kerouac's own Buddhism is a true beat Zen, which confuses anything goes at the existential level with anything goes on the artistic and social levels. Nevertheless, there is something enduring, endearing about Kerouac's personality as a writer, something which comes out in the warmth of his admiration for Gary Snyder and in the lusty, generous enthusiasm for life which wells up at every point in his colorful and undisciplined prose. This exuberant warmth makes it impossible to put Kerouac in the class of that beat mentality described by John Cleon Holmes. 
John Cleon Holmes wrote a book called Go, which was really uh, came out in 1950, one of the fir- or 51, one of the first real beatnik novels. Jack Kerouac published a novel in 1950, but it wasn't about um, the beat lifestyle. It was called The Town and the City. Basically, it was about his experiences growing up on the East Coast. So John Cleon Holmes is, is uh, what many people at that time thought um, uh, his type of, of, of beat uh, was what the, the beatniks were really like. So the beat mentality described by John Cleon Holmes, the cool, fake, intellectual hipster searching for kicks, name-dropping bitch of zen and jazz jargon to justify a disaffiliation from society, which is in fact just ordinary, callous exploitation of other people. In the North Beach, Greenwich Village, and elsewhere, such characters may occasionally be found, but no one has ever heard of any of them, and their identification with the active artists and poets of these communities is pure journalistic imagination. They are, however, the shadow of a substance, the low-level caricature which always attends spiritual and cultural movements, carrying them to extremes which their authors never really intended. To this extent, Beat Zen is sowing confusion in idealizing as art and life what is better kept to oneself as therapy. So... um, the irony here is that I would accuse Alan Watts of some of the same thing he's accusing of Jack Kerouac. Cause, yeah. uh, Alan Watts was also very involved in the hippie movement and was a regular in the at Haight Ashbury. Sure. And uh, was uh, featured many times in the the hippie magazine, the San Francisco Oracle. And he had no problem adopting a persona and using it right. to his advantage. Right. And, and, and he, loves, he loved the marijuana and the psychedelics and, and all the other things that go with that as much as uh, the beats did. So, um, it's really all I have on the Dharma bumps. So, so, but just to summarize, so far you've covered Castaneda, Kerouac, and a little bit of Alan Watts. Three is sort of the key figures in kind of the counterculture that started in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and however you might want to criticize the way they did it in retrospect, armchair. Um, Monday morning quarterback. Yeah, Monday morning quarterback, <laughs> spiritually speaking. Um, they did it. I mean, I mean, they, along with theosophy, with which theosophy claims, you know, theosophy brought the Eastern teachings in the first wave. And then, and then these guys, though, um, gave it a shot in the arm, gave a whole other dose to it. They, in both cases, I think they brought... Um, they expanded people's understanding of what religion and spirituality can be in America. Yeah. Um, some of it, um, you know, may be misunderstood or... Some of it was naive. And naive or, <laughs> or um, an outright theft of other yeah. people's work. Yeah. But still, uh, I think, very important that uh, these people wrote and... Uh, made the contributions they did. They, yeah. they certainly influenced my life, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm glad that they uh, they wrote these books. Mm-hmm. So the last book I wanted to talk about today is Masters and Men by Virginia Hansen. Uh, this is something, uh, a book I came across uh, rather late uh, in my life, and um, as well as theosophy. I wish I had discovered it sooner, but I didn't. I never made it down the road from the Quest Bookshop. Um, I think if I would have, uh, things would have been different, but um, uh, I finally did get there. So I was, I became interested in the secret doctrine. And what I kind of figured out was maybe the road to the secret doctrine was through the Mahatma letters. That is, that I had to read the Mahatma letters first in order to really get a better grasp of what was going on in the secret doctrine. So I started on that journey of reading the Mahatma letters. And um, I'm the person that I just won't read the letters. I start looking for the secondary literature on it and, you know, who can help me out in trying to understand these letters. And obviously one of the persons I came across was uh, Virginia Hansen because she wrote the Reader's Guide to the Mahatma's Letters. So I picked that book up. And somewhere along the way, I had learned that uh, she wrote a novel called Masters of Men and Men. And that uh, I had found, 
the Dharma Bums being a perfect example, sometimes reading a novel about a historical period or about historical people can put you in the place, the time, the mindset to better understand what's going on. And um, I, I found that especially be true with this book, Masters and Men. So I picked it up and read it. Uh, I thought it was a great book. Virginia uh, draws on obviously a number of, of sources, uh, letters, journals, uh, writings of the people who were living at that time and, and, and novelized it. And I have a great deal um, respect for her because Virginia introduced me to some individuals that I probably would have never have, uh, been introduced to if it hadn't been for this book. Um, for example, Damodar, uh, Franz Hartman, uh, Anna, Anna Kingsford. These are all characters, um, actual people uh, that uh, I've enjoyed learning more about and, and studying as I uh, worked my way through the Mahatma letters. So the interesting thing uh, about this book, too, is uh, Virginia Hansen is, is a historian, and she wrote a novel and yet she was probably faced at many times with, well, how do I write this up? Because there are conflicting episodes between conflicting perspectives from uh, different individuals. So, um, for example... You mean conflicting versions of how things happened? Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, let me see if I can find it. So I'm wasting your tape. No, it's right. Okay. In this particular section, uh, Virginia Hansen draws on the writings of um, Charles uh, Ledbetter and also uh, A.P. Sinnott. Should I talk about what the book's about? Or does everybody know? You mean the Mahama letters? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah you could... Uh, <laughs> we're, we're jumping around here, but, but before you read it, yeah, I mean, just to be sure, so this is a fictionalized account of of the Mahatma letters, right? And the Mahatma letters are what? Well, they were uh, letters that were sent to A.P. Sennett, who was a a, a British journalist uh, in India at the time, and he had met A.P. Um, H.P. Blavatsky, and um, she got him into contact with these Mahatmas or Tibetan masters. And uh, they, he was very interested in practical occultism, that is, how to perform magic, magic, magic tricks. But tricks in the sense that um, looked as if they were defying the laws of nature. Um, of course, HPB would say, no, no, there's no defying the laws of nature. This is all natural law that's happening here. There's nothing supernatural here. Um, these adepts, though, have the ability to do things that normal people don't have the ability to do. So he was interested in that, but later learned that really what is more important is uh, the philosophy of, of occultism and universal brotherhood, because that's what the Mahatmas were teaching. And uh, after some time he came around to the idea and um, really thought that the Mahatmas were the, the future of the Theosophical Society. And in fact, um, that is where some of these uh, other historical individuals, such as Anna Kingsford and A.P. Sennett, differed. And uh, for example, Anna, Anna Kingsford thought that the Theosophical Society should be just, a much, just as much about Western esotericism as it is about the Mahatmas. And there was a, a, a big disagreement within the society regarding that. Uh, so much so that uh, AP Senate wanted Anna Kingsford, who was the president of the London Lodge, to to uh, not be president anymore. And so there's a huge conflict. The Mahatmas weighed in on it. Uh, everybody had an opinion. And at the end of the day, um, uh, depending on how you look at the history, either Anna was voted out 
or she decided not to run for president for the London Lodge again. And this was, um, it's interesting because Henry S. Alcott says that uh, Anna, in Old Diary Leaves, Anna decided not to run again. So another person was elected president of the London Lodge. AP Senate and Charles Leadbeater said no, she ran and was uh, defeated in a humiliating uh, 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 vote. She got you know just a, f a handful of votes versus everybody else. So I'm thinking, well, gee, I'm Virginia here. What do I do here with these conflicting accounts? And um, I think that the way she handled it was correct because the book is really about AP Senate's letters that, you know, his, the letters that AP Senate received from the Mahatmas. Um, and it was basically his story during this time and also uh, a patient Senate, his wife. So he would, should, she should draw on uh, AP Senate's version and uh, Charles Leadbeater's because his version, Charles uh, uh, supported AP Senate's version. So, but I'm wondering what happened. Why was Alcott's version different? Why would he see it differently? Well, I did a lot of studying of Anna Kingsford and she had a spiritual companion, human being, uh, Edward Maitland, who uh, ba basically supported Anna wherever she went. And uh, he was, if you read his biography of Anna Kingsford, he was uh, with her uh, for most of uh, her uh, adult life, working with her. Anna Kingsford actually is an amazing person in the sense that she was a medical doctor at a time when women were not allowed in England to um, get a medical degree. Degree. She actually had to go to France to get it, and then she came back and was a medical doctor for women's issues, uh, one of the early ones to do that. Anna King Kingsford was an anti-vivisectionist. Um, if you don't know what that is, that is somebody who is opposed to using animals for medical experiments. She was also a vegetarian. Um, and uh, she was, she had visions, and she uh, wrote a book about her visions called *The Perfect Way*, which was enormously popular in England. And that's actually that book got her uh, got the Theosophical Society interested in her, and later she became president of the London Lodge. And what role does she play in *Masters*, *Masters of Math*? Well, in, the, in here, it's AP Senate's struggles with Anna Kingsford because they, they didn't get along at all. A Anna had a very strong personality. I would say that her personality was as strong as HPB's. And um, she wanted to take the society in a different direction than uh, AP Senate did. AP Senate thought that the, the, the Mahatmas and their teachings was the way that the society should go, and that's the way that eventually the society did go. But Anna Kingsford thought that uh, the Theosophical Society should go in the, in the direction of Western Hermeticism. And um, it, what happened was, I am all over the place, aren't I? That's <laughs> right. Um, uh, what happened was is that she was not re-elected president and Alcott decided that, well, why don't we have two lodges, two London lodges, one for studying Western Hermeticism and one following um, uh, the Mahatmas. And so everybody was satisfied with this solution. But then they found that people were signing up for both lodges and that was still causing a lot of problems in the London Lodge. So the decision was made that either that members for the London Lodge could sign up for only one. And um, so this was not satisfactory to Anna Kingsford. Most people sided with AP Senate. So Anna decided to return her charter for her Lodge and go out on her own and create her own uh, Hermetic Lodge. And um, so 
or Hermetic Society. So she's formed a separate society from the Theosophical Society. And this happened about 19, 1886, 1887. And, um, is, she, that, is that covered in Masters and Men? That is, yes, it is. Okay. And so it's sort of a dramatization of all yeah, of these. Yeah, she, re, uh, she writes about that. Let me just uh, go right to that. The Hermetic Lodge, T.S., became an established fact on the 9th of April. Unfortunately, it did not prove to be a resolution of the problem. The members wanted to get the benefit of the studies of both lodges, and the effect was to keep up the excitement. We're not quite sure what that means, keep up the excitement. I think it means that there was still a great deal of conflict between Synod and Kingsford, that uh, there was uh, competition between the two lodges, and uh, it was uh, harming uh, the Theosophical Society. The colonel was finally obliged to issue a new rule to the effect that multiple membership would not be allowed. No person could be an active member of more than one branch simultaneously, and where double membership existed, choice should be made in which group the individual preferred to remain. The effect of this was to threaten the disruption of the Hermetic Lodge. After consultations, Mrs. Gin uh, Kingsford uh, decided to return her charter and form her friends into an independent society, thus making it feasible for members to belong to both groups if they wished to do so. So by creating a separate society, um, you could. that was the other thing at that time, um, a lot of individuals back then belonged to multiple societies. Some were Freemasons and also were members of the Theosophical Society or were members of the, the Hermetic uh, Society. Um, Anna Kingsford died. She, uh, about two years later, she had tuberculosis. And when she died, the, the, the Hermetic Society uh, folded. Uh, just a few weeks later, though, the Golden Dawn was born. Mm. And many members who were in the Hermetic Society as well as in the gold, uh, uh, Theosophical Society, were also members of the Golden Dawn. So there was a lot of people going back and forth between these different uh, societies at that time. It's a very, very interesting time uh, from 1875 up into uh, the First World War is, is incredibly interesting to me as a period of, of spiritual enri enrichment. Basically, uh, uh, a Victorian renaissance of the occult mm. and that's why um, I continue to read in this area and continue to find new things about the people and and uh, the teachings of that time and and sort of all that kind of movement that action is encapsulated colorfully and dramatically in, in uh, Masters and Men yes it it is and it's a book that I continue to go back so if there's a particular incident uh, or time period during the, um, uh, the time when AP Senate was receiving the Mahatma letters, I usually turn back to Masters and Men because it's it's expertly written and it gives me some ideas of where to look. She, uh, as I mentioned earlier, she draws on many of the early sources from the society, and um, they're they're very easy. Then it's it's easy for me then to track these down mm -hmm. and, and, and investigate them uh, in a more thorough manner. Okay, so um, so you've covered a lot of ground here. Yes, I have. You've yes, I have. A lot of ground. I guess the common thing here here is that uh, all these novels, to uh, a greater or lesser degree, have uh, uh, claimed to be uh, historical. Masters of Men definitely well documented historical facts, events, and persons. And Don Juan, uh, not so much. Right, right. <laughs> Kerouac. And Kerouac, though, is is certainly an autobiographical novel. Yeah. So, um, but I can't stress uh, enough that if you can, if you find uh, a historical period that you're interested in, and uh, you can read a novel about that period, I think it it will make your uh, your research much easier. Uh, and certainly give you a perspective and an understanding of, of the time and the culture better than if you try to just uh, you know, dig deep in, into the, uh, the diaries, the journals, uh, and, and the writings of these individuals uh, by themselves. So it's a, it's a very exciting way to 
get started. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So one last question. Um, <clears throat> so can you talk about what is, why do you like so much to read? Because you do a lot of reading, I know, and uh, most of it is this esoteric spirituality. So what is it about it that, that you enjoy so much? What is it, let me rephrase it, what is it you enjoy so much about reading the books in our library? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm searching. You know, yeah. I'm on a path, and I've been on several paths uh, in my life. I've studied shamanism, Buddhism, yoga, theosophy, Western esotericism. I haven't found my home yet, and I'm still looking. And I may never find my home, um, but that's okay. Yeah, I, I I'm enjoying, You're enjoying the search, right? Yeah, I'm enjoying the search. Yeah. So, um, maybe maybe I will find a place to uh, hang my hat and coat. Uh, otherwise, I'll be on the road. Okay, Pete Harris, a very serious, creative student of esoteric spirituality, theosophist. Thank you very much for being here, Pete Harris. Thank you. <laughs>